The chair notes the time is six o'clock. I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As ZBA chair, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. We'll begin with a roll call of the ZBA members and panel for tonight's meeting. Steve Judge is present. Mr. Craig Meadows. Mr. Everald Henry. Can you, anybody, can you hear me? I can hear you. Everald? Yeah. I can hear you. I, I think everyone froze. I'm sorry. Um, oh. Henry, That's present. What, present. And Mr. Meadows, are you present? I think I didn't hear you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I can't hear you. That's funny. Yeah, your sorry. microphone, Craig, is muted. Sorry. <clears throat> Continue. Ms. Marshall? I'm here. And Ms. Ms. Greenbaum? I'm here. All right. The quorum is present. Also tonight, attending tonight's public hearing is Mr. Rob Mora, Building Commissioner, and Mr. Rob Wachilla, Climber for the Town. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of the members of the public will be permitted but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the, meet, the proceedings in real time via technological means. The Board of Appeals is a, the Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 48 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with the statute, um, I, um, my printer didn't print up my normal oh dear it's, that's okay i've got it um virtually Mem electronically here yeah <laughs> and i should have it by memory after all these years but um you know, here we go according to the provisions of chapters of provisions of massachusetts general law chapter 40a and article 10 special permit granting authority of the Amersoning bylaw this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are open to and are recorded by town staff and may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and ZDA webpage. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or for additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to, re to speak, they should so indicate by using the raise hand function on their screen or by pressing pound nine on their phone. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you're recognized, provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of the hearing to file a decision for a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing the file plus decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed in the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there is a 20 day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body in Superior Court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the Registry of Deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda, the public hearing on ZBA FY 2023-12 Thomas and David Casey request for a special permit under section 3.01, 3.3211, and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw to construct a non-owner occupied duplex consisting of two units with each containing four bedrooms, eight total, on the same parcel as an existing two-story duplex with seven bedrooms at 798 800 North Pleasant Street, map 8A, parcel 66, RN Re Neighborhood Residence Zoning District. This is continued from July 27th, 2023. There'll be a general public comment period on matters not before the board tonight. 
other business not anticipated within the last 40 hour, 48 hours and adjournment. First order of business is consideration of minutes from July 27th. Um, I have looked over the minutes. I don't think there's any changes. Does anybody yes. have any, any comments or cha suggested changes? Yes, Ms. Greenbaum. I believe that I, I wrote it down. I think it's on page five um, that you misspelled Kathy's name. It's a C A T H Y. Or count the counselor Shane? Yes. Okay. Got it. Good catch. Noted. Ms. Marshall. Yes, page five. Yeah. Um, I have I have several, but bef before I go into them, I wonder if it's acceptable if we have if we just see typos, can we send them in advance directly to Rob, or do we have to raise them here in the meeting, where it's not changing the the meaning or anything, just a spelling? Well, I would. I've done that in other com other committees. We can just send send. I would, you know, I. You can have a conversation with Rob almost on, as long as no other member, my understanding is as long as mm -hmm. no other member is part of that conversation, you can have a conversation with the staff about substantive matters, not okay. much less typographical matters. So okay. I think that would be okay, but um, Rob just same. rubbed his head, so I might be wrong. <laughs> Was that, is that correct, Rob? I mean, no, just... I wasn't rubbing my head because of that. Yeah, be <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, I'll do that next time. So, so, uh, page two. Mm -hmm. Um, the paragraph below the three bullets. The last sentence of that <clears throat> said, "Building commissioner to determine the extent, not extent." Yep. yep. Um, uh, and that, okay, page four, the fourth bullet, um, only because this is <clears throat> clearly an important issue, the comment from Josna, if that's correct, mm -hmm. I think it's complementary with an E, not an I. So just to match the, it's in the bylaw. Yeah. Okay, um, and then page five, item four B about an EV charging station. I think that <clears throat> applicant said they would, they would in, I, I think make it EV ready, but I'm not sure they said they would actually create that. So, so basically maybe, what- Maybe my memory is wrong about that. No, so basically what they said during the hearing, Sarah, was that- mm -hmm. um, they're going to make it possible to convert those spots to EV spots. I think they're going to put the conduits in the ground, right? Just beforehand, but they weren't going to actually make them like EV spots. That's right. why that's the way I interpreted from the meeting transcript. Right. So does B four B correctly reflect that? It says show the location of at least one EV charging station with the ability to expand. So it's correct in that I put that in the list of requirements in their plans. They did uh -huh. agree to show them anyways, <clears throat> just to show where they would go I in see. case they want to install them in the future. I mean, do you want me to clarify that better? I, I just I, I just want it to be accurate. I'm, I'll defer well, to So, so Ms. Marshall, there, these, are board these are the items that staff sent to the applicant saying, this is saying, here's what we need you to, to do. So okay. I, those should probably be accurate, accurately reflect pretty actually sent. Okay. Okay, right? but, it's not it's not memorializing our conversation about the issue. But I think it, you raise a good point that it should memorialize our conversation someplace in the minutes because that was um, said the applicant did say that that they would uh, make ready the EV stations. So that should be someplace in the in the discussion. I think Rob. Yep, I can include that. Okay, can I go on or tell me when I, I, I think I only have, I think I only have one more. <laughs> All right, well, just hold on and let, yeah. let Rob know what he's going to do, and then we'll get your next one. Okay. All right, Ms. Marshall. So the U-Drive South. 
the, the sign business. First bullet. I think it should, I suggest it be clarified here that this is the town's wayfinding sign project. Because again, I was completely bad. I was so confused what we were talking about because the permit was granted for the owner's sign, owner's sign. And this instead is now approving a town owned sign. So I just mm -hmm. think that should be clear. Yeah. So it could be in that first bullet, could be in the fourth bullet, proposed town owned welcome sign. I think just do it right up front. Okay. Um, town owned wayfinding sign project to be, make it clear. Okay, that's it. All right, any other suggested changes to the minutes? All right, um, I entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So moves, is there a second? Right. Mr. Henry seconds, um, any further discussion? If there's no further discussion, the vote occurs on the motion. Uh, the chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. Ms. Greenwald? Aye. Motion is unanimous, vote is unanimous, motion is carried. Next order of business is, um, are, are there any further dis disclosures from members on the panel? We had disclosures regarding this in uh, July 27th. They don't have to be repeated, but if there's anything new. Do I, should I disclose that uh, I do business with the law firm from this, this lawyer is a partner? Okay. All right, any other disclosures? Are not. If not, um, next order of business is ZBA FY 2023 12, Thomas and David Casey, request for the special permit under section 3.01, 3.211, and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw to construct a non owner occupied duplex consisting of two units, with each unit containing four bedrooms, eight total, on the same parcel as the existing two story duplex with seven bedrooms at 798 800 North Pleasant Street, map 8A, parcel 66, RN, Neighborhood Residence Zoning District. This is continued from 7-27-2023 meeting. Let me read some submissions. Um, most of these are in the project application report, but there are also additional submissions since uh, that July meeting. They, they include uh, a complaint from the um, applicant a complaint response form, staff submissions, a 798-800 North Pleasant Street police log through July 31st, 2023, two order correct issued by John Thompson in July of 2020, and three rental permit issued July 12th, 2023, expired June 30th, 2023. In addition, there are other submissions which include um, Inspection services date of July 20. Those are met, those were here from uh, staff that's from town. Then we have a letter from Josna Reggae of July 27th. We have a letter from members of the of, from Councillor Shane from July 27th. We have a memo from Councillor Shane from November 4th. We have a list of code related issues from inspection services dated 9-19-2023. There is a, um, included some included in the record with some of the re re referenced zoning uh, board of the zoning bylaw uh, sections that we had discussed and that have been referenced in the discussion by the board. There was a September 20th memo um, from Josna Reg and Rebecca Miller. There is a September 21st email and letter from um, Mr. Tom Reedy Esquire asking for a, the hearing to be continued to October 26th. There's a September 23rd meeting from our September 23rd memo and letter from 
numerous residents of the neighborhood that we received. There's a um, alternative um, map showing which um, properties in the neighborhood are owner occupied and non owner occupied. There's a um, um, and those are rental identified as rental properties. There's a trash picture of a trash pin bin as of September 2023. There is a September 24th uh, letter from Denise Barbaret. There's a September 26th letter from uh, Becky Miller and um, I think Josna Reggae again, um, follow up on the Zoning Board of Appeals meeting. Then there's a meeting, um, a letter from Ira Brick on se September 27th. And lastly, we have um, um, a letter from Mr. Tom Reedy Esquire of Bacon Wilson requesting the, the permission to withdraw without press prejudice this application for a special permit. Rob, have I, have I missed any submissions? Is there anything else we need to reference? No, you, you pretty much hit everything, Mr. Chairman. Um, I can't think of anything else that wasn't left out of the list you just described. Great. All right. So um, given that that's the submissions, uh, who's going to be representing the applicant tonight? Mr. Reedy? I believe so. And um, I can promote him to uh, yep. panelists so he can More give us a Yep. All right. You should be joining us shortly. Mr. Reedy, are you representing the applicant? I am. All right. Would you just state your name and address for the record? I'd be happy to. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. For the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson out of Amherst uh, here on behalf of the applicant. Great. So just as a notice for the board, uh, we have two requests from the applicant. The first was for a further continuance and the second was for a withdrawal without prejudice. So I assume that the applicant would like us to consider the request to withdraw without precedent first. And then if that is not approved, consider the request to continue the public hearing until October 26th. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I, I think that's fair to say. The, the obvious hope is that you'll accept that withdrawal without prejudice, and then this will be right. kind of taken off your docket. Um, and, and then the, the continuance is moved. Exactly. Precisely, yes. All right. And if we have to technically withdraw whatever you need for that, that's, you know, we're happy to do that. But the, the hope is to withdraw essentially based upon yep. uh, all the information that we've got. got. So the procedure we're gonna follow tonight is, is, is this. Um, we're gonna have the applicant present why they wish to withdraw the application. Then the board and the staff will discuss the request to withdraw. We'll permit com public comment on the motion to withdraw, but not on the merits of the application itself. And after the subsequent questions from the board, we'll move to a public meeting while keeping the public hearing open for consideration of a motion to permit the withdrawal of the application. So does, does everybody understand the process tonight? All right. Mr. Reedy, uh, do you wish to speak to the, your request to withdraw the application without prejudice? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's pretty simple. Um, you know, I got involved with these folks subsequent to their July, I think it was 27th hearing. Uh, I happened to be on that hearing earlier in the evening. Subsequently, I you know, maybe a couple weeks ago, I started working with them. Um, got my feet under me a bit with some of the material, had a subsequent conversation with uh, the town thought it would be best to continue to give us some more time to really process you know, all of the comments, saw some additional comments, had an additional conversation with the town and thought that it would be in our best interest just to, to withdraw um, and frankly go back to the drawing board, uh, understanding that there were comments about management, um, et cetera. You know, when we think about when I when I approach these, I, I think of it in the context of 10.38. Um, and you know that was something that I think we have to consider a little bit um, more strongly. So we had that, we had to talk about complementary use, is it allowed, is it not allowed? And so we thought, listen, at this point, well, let's withdraw, uh, let's go back to the drawing board and then uh, let's get our feet under us 
um, with the management of the property, and then let's figure out what ultimately, you know, we, you know, they want to do um, with the property. So it was really just kind of based on the totality of circumstances, we thought at this point, it was best to request that withdrawal uh, without prejudice. Great. Um, I, I'd like to ask Rob Moore to frame this issue for us a bit, because it's been there, there's been a lot of conversations about, uh, and a lot of confusion, I think, about numerous provisions of the zoning bylaw, complementary requirements under 10.38, et cetera, et cetera. Rob, would you just kind of discuss some of the issues that have been raised by this application and how the town is viewing them and how you are viewing them? May I just ask one question? Before yes, Mr. Time Mr. Henry, absolutely. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Um, Henry. Um, um, if what will be different if we grant your motion to withdraw when you come back? What will be different? Um, first of all, will we come back? Uh, second of all, would we come back with what would it look like? Like, I don't, I, I mean, really at this point, I have, I have no idea, right? I, I don't even know if they would come back. And if so, I don't know if they would come back with some different, uh, you know, is it, is it, I, I, <laughs> I don't even know, right? So I think it's just the, the problem with not granting with the withdrawal. And I guess what would it be? Forcing us to go forward. If you force us to go forward, then I think at the least we should be granted a continuation so that we can look to address all of the comments made by the public. The problem with that is then we we're just prolonging this when we frankly don't want to go forward on this because, you know, um we just think that there's probably if there is a better way to do it we'd like to a approach that better way to do it. So I can't tell you at this point, like we haven't done plans. It's, this isn't something where we withdraw, redo the plans and then say, okay, here's what we're doing, right? We, we withdraw, get our feet under us. You know, they're listening, like I'm talking to them. And, and you know, I think we haven't seen each other much in this forum. You know, I do this quite often. We listen to what the neighbors are saying. Like we take that to heart. They're, they're looking at the site. And so I think they're really figuring out, okay, you know, two units in a different building on the same site, is that the best? Is it first, let's get our house in order, right? They, I think they've been in the past couple of years better than they've been in the past, but there's probably still room for improvement. And so it's talking about that. So before we even were to bring something else forward, I think, you know, when I use the phrase, get your house in order, I think that's where we're at. So. You know, I can't tell you, oh, we're going to come back with a, I just don't know. Thank you. Ms. Marshall. Yeah, so could you just um, clarify? I think I understand, but I would like it to be explicit what you mean by without prejudice. Yeah, so if you, if you um, allow us to withdraw, then... You know, we include without prejudice because essentially if you don't, it's tantamount to a denial. If you deny us, we're prohibited from bringing back the exact same application for a period of two years. Now, can they get things together in a period of two years so that um, maybe it makes sense? Maybe. Um, would, you know, when we've had conversations with the zoning enforcement officer about what complementary uses mean, does in the interim some the, the bylaw change? Does a case come out that says, oh, hey, look, this is how it should be interpreted? And then we'd be prohibited from coming back. So it really just kind of takes it out of your hands, says, listen, we hear you. We're not going to go forward here. And then kind of frankly, offline, if the building commissioner's determination is that this can't be brought because it's not, we're here because we thought it could be brought. If his determination is, so by pulling it out, we're not fighting that fight right now. If they determine, if he determines, oh, it can't be brought because they're not complementary uses, then we're not back in front of you on the same thing because we're prohibited from coming back before you on the same thing. So this is, it's really just to allow us to um, exit and then still preserve opportunities if something else materially changes. So in short, Ms. Marshall, it means they can't bring back the exact same thing. They can bring back something different on that property, right? Uh, if, is that correct, Tom? I said without they can, prejudice means you could bring back the same they could, product yes. if you wish to, That's, not that they couldn't. But if they do that, we would have we'd be in the exact same position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have. But but with right. prejudice means don't come back. <laughs> don't come back for two don't years. Come back with with this, yeah, same with thing. That right. Yeah. Right. Yes. 
All right, um, Mr. Mora. Uh, thank you. So I, I thought I'd just make some comments about a couple of sections of the bylaw. Uh, it's been uh, commented on, discussed at length by you know much of the public uh, responses, and uh, I'm sure the board's been looking at, at these provisions as well. And uh, starting with section 3.01, and that's kind of the main focus of, um, you know, concern with uh, this application as, as has been written so far uh, in, in multiple examples. Uh, and that, that language says that the development on a single lot of more than one dwelling or more than one principal use is expressly prohibited, except where those principal uses are clearly complementary to each other. So that's the unclear language that we're all kind of struggling with a little bit. Uh, and, and I am reminded of a conversation I had with our town attorney where he, he told me that every time he reads it, he thinks something else afterwards. Uh, so I think we're all probably feeling a little bit of that. But uh, I do wanna talk about you know, how we've looked at this in the past up to this point. Uh, and maybe a week ago, I started looking at it a little bit differently. Um, I've been asked over the years, uh, many times, can I put two single family houses on a lot? I have in every instance said no. Uh, I, I'd say, I've said that, you know, my read of this is that, you know, the dwelling that it's referring to is a single family dwelling, we don't define it. And I'm not willing to, you know, per permit that type of development uh, without the bylaw having standards and conditions and criteria to deal with that if the town ever chose to do something like that. So that's been a hard no over, over and over again, uh, year after year. Now, every other combination of uses, uh, one or two different types of principal uses or of the same type of use as listed in table three has gone forward to the Board of Appeals for consideration in the past. Uh, and in some cases, the planning board if they're non-residential uses typically. Uh, and that, you know, that has been viewed as well, you know, under the special permit granting authority, if the board, you know, found it appropriate to allow more than one building, more than one use, made the connection and finding that they're complementary to each other, perhaps it has the possibility to move forward. So that's, you know, that's where we are today. The board has granted permits for two duplexes, more than one duplex on a property. The board has granted permits for uh, a duplex and a single family. So more than one dwelling on a property. Uh, so we, we've done that. There's not many of them. There's a, a, a small number of them, maybe three or four in the, the 12 years that I've been working here that I can recall. Uh, but this application really caused me to look closely at this language, and I have questions. I have concerns about how we've interpreted the bylaw or how the bylaw maybe hasn't been interpreted yet and just been, you know, used. And I want to look at that. And so that I guess what I'm here to tell the board is that if this application is withdrawn, and I would suggest that it, it is probably a good thing to with, let this application be withdrawn. The applicant has no involvement with this conversation other than my few conversations with Mr. Reedy over the last couple of days. Uh, the applicant had no uh, idea that this was a question or a concern of mine. Uh, and I uh, would like to have my questions answered, talk a little bit more with the town attorney and uh, be able to come up with a clear interpretation of this section so that no other application gets in front of the board unless it's something that can move forward and has a path so that the board can do their work and judge it on its merits. So um, that's where I am with this. Um, you know, I, I, I feel like this application being withdrawn is the right move. Uh, and, and not moving forward under the um, expectation that it originally was uh, filed under as you know two complementary uses in the same use classification. Uh, and I can, you know, I'd be happy to answer any more questions that I can. I, 
I think I've had some conversations with Rob and I'm in agreement that I think the, um, the right, this is the best path for us at this time. And I think it, uh, for a whole lot of reasons, it takes this an, a issue that was not clear on both the uh, complementary uses as well as I think on 10.38, it seems clear to me that there needs to be more clarity on the complementary uses issue as well as I think other provisions on this from this application. And I'm in favor of withdrawing this and letting the uh, applicant come back and rework this if they're going to come up with something at all. Ms. Marshall. Yeah, I'd like to my notes to be accurate. So if Mr. Moore can just correct me, this is what I think I heard you say that allowing two single family homes on one lot has been a hard no, but that it has been allowed at least for applications to move forward if it's two different kinds of residential structures like a single family home and a duplex, is that? Or two, you, you said two duplexes. So which, not two single family homes, but two duplexes, which is seems to be what we're talking, what this application was about, so. Right, so um, two uh, single family houses has always been a no. Now the bylaw doesn't have a uh, permitting path uh, through a land use uh, permit. So it's not, it's not done by the planning board or the zoning board. It's simply, yes, they just move right into building permits. So when I've been asked, can I put two dwellings on a lot? The answer has been no, because there isn't any mechanism to approve that. Um, I, I read that language very plainly and said not more than one dwelling. And I referred to the dwelling that it states in that section 3.01 as a single family dwelling. That's how I read that and applied that. Um, th we don't have much guidance, you know, from that point on. Uh, so when we think about two duplexes and, you know, I had this conversation with the town attorney, the town attorney said, well, the board's not prohibited from granting a special permit for two duplexes, but it really would be nice if the bylaw somewhere else said, go ahead and do it if the board allows it. And that's where we are. We don't have that language. I've searched for it. It doesn't. It doesn't um, suggest that, uh, that more than one duplex could be permitted. And then I think you get into a similar conversation when you look at uh, a duplex and a single family dwelling. And maybe that even gets trickier. When we move on to the bigger residential uh, prop, uh, developments, apartments and townhouses, it all of a sudden gets clearer because the bylaw in other sections very clearly says one or more buildings, three Not or dwelling. more units, yeah. right? Yeah. So it changed, and we don't, you know, we don't define dwelling in the bylaw. Yeah. So it starts to really clearly open up the opportunity for, say, three apartment buildings on a property, as long as all the other dimensional requirements are met. Uh, so we've had, you know, we've had the the duplex and the single family permitted. We've had more than one duplex when it's combined with an apartment project. So again, it's a different situation. Mm -hmm. It's a, you know, it was that particular case was a property very large that could be divided up into multiple parcels if it wanted to, just not the same situation. We haven't permitted a case just like this. Mm -hmm. Two duplexes on a lot that cannot fit anything else you know, that, that um, in the duplex category. Um, so we haven't done one, we haven't permitted something just like this one that's in front of you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Henry, you have your hand up. I, I, I think Ms. Greenbaum was first. Okay, Ms. Greenbaum. If he wants to go first, he can. It's not. Oh, um, I, I just I, didn't keep track of order correctly. I'm sorry. Well, I've been troubled by this application when I first read the legal ad before I was even put on this panel. And I know that there are other situations pending that are similar. The difference between this one and some of the others that have been granted, except for the 
I think he's talking about the two single family homes in the duplex, maybe North Amherst. And I'm not sure whether that's village center or neighborhood, but the ones that have been granted and the one that I know about that may be pending down the line are in general residence. And this is neighborhood residence. And uh, I think that we need to have some clarity on the issue because it's also a neighborhood, neighborhood um, discussion, put it that way, to what, what may happen. I think Mr. Reedy knows what I'm talking about. Um, I think you can make a case for the duplexes and the triplexes because they are different uses and it is a different zoning area. All you have to do is add an efficiency apartment to each one and you got three units in each building or the buildings could have been buying. You can make a case for that, I think. Um, I'm a little bit hesitant here because a member of my family has a similar thing going on, I believe, but I'm not sure. On, on North Whitney Street, but that again is a single and a duplex, which are not the same use in the table. I was so concerned by this issues and the precedents it might be setting, I started my research. Red Bobrovsky couldn't find anything about complementary uses. And apparently from everything I was reading online and cases, there are no cases except for a couple where there are business use with a residential use or Judy's downtown, which is a, the addition is a mixed use building with a restaurant, which are clearly not in conflict with each other, except maybe parking knows. But um, I've done the research independently and I am concerned about the issue of without prejudice, because I really don't want this to come back. I don't want to set the precedent of people dividing up their property and putting more units on it, especially when the neighbor next door doesn't want to sell the extra land. Um, I, I, I can say this one positive thing, Todd. One positive thing came out of this. I'm used to driving by that house every single day I go anywhere because the shortest distance between North Amherst and downtown is North Pleasant Street. All of a sudden I'm driving and I didn't recognize the house. It happened to be a Monday morning and the CBA site visit was gonna be on Tuesday. So for that, we can be thankful that that whole yard got cleaned up and the brush cleaned away. And it, it, it really didn't look out bad when we got there. So maybe it's, for a while, at least for the picture we got of the garbage, it was a, that the application was an improvement for the neighborhood. And so I, I'm hesitant about the with prejudice part, without prejudice part. But if I vote no, that sort of leaves us in a very bad situation. Uh, what does that mean? So I will I pass the baton on to the next speaker. All right. Mr. Henry. So I, I have a few comments and then some questions. Um, my, my, my first comment is that um, if you look at the word complementary, I, I get that that has been the struggle with um, a lot of people. Um, it, it means complete or to supply mutual needs. That's my interpretation of that. And based on what we've heard, that is the intent of this new building, it's mutual need. There's a building there that's performing one function and adding another one will do just that. Um, the other question, um, so <clears throat> and if I understood Rob Moore correctly, um, if the bylaw doesn't say we can't grant this permit, doesn't stand to reason that we can. If there's no definition of complementary, doesn't, doesn't allow us to interpret that definition make a finding that where where it is vague, we can, you know, we have a discussion and then we say, and then we make a decision based on that. And if we're not, and if we grant this request to withdraw this petition, are we saying that then we're gonna go back to the attorneys or um, rewrite the bylaws to give a definitive defi definition of complementary, therefore it is no longer um, unambiguous? And what is a process that surrounds that? And if 
we do go in and define complementary, um, doesn't it mean that whenever anyone comes back to us for a special permit, it doesn't require as much because then there's a definition we can simply look and says no, yes, without even having a discussion because it is right there in black and white. And now my question is, <clears throat> given the size of this lot, um, an option would arguably be to def divide this lot. If it was divided, wouldn't then this petitioner be allowed to build this building on the divided lot? Mr. Mora? So this particular lot does not have the minimum frontage and area to be separated into two parcels. So okay. that is not that is not an option. If it had if it had additional area and at least twenty thousand square feet for each lot, then it could happen if that was the scenario. But that isn't the case here. And I just I just want to just back up on something on your comment, uh, just to make sure um, the issue about the complementary uses is, the, the question about it is understood because you know one of the questions here is do we even have the ability to consider if two duplexes are complement complementary to each other or as we read 3.01 where the language says you know not to develop on a single lot more than one dwelling or more than one principal use described in 3.3. The one of the questions here is if you're using two of one type of principal use, is that more than one principal use or does it have to be two different types of principal uses? And I hope this is somewhat clear, you know, making some sense, but it's, you know, it, that's part of what makes it unclear. And, you know, one one read of it initially was that, yeah, two of anything is more than one. Uh, but I think that needs to be looked at closer. Uh, you know, and to another one of your comments, uh, my goal is to uh, is to kind of work through this, get whatever legal advice that's needed to both make sure we have a clear interpretation of this bylaw. And to be quite honest, there's more than one other pending application of this type or uh, design teams working on applications of this type that I know about. So I need to get an answer to this. And if the answer is supported legally that an application can come to the board, then the board will have to you know, deal with that and, and, and go through the process, but if it is different than what we thought it might have been originally, or if there's a recommendation to amend the bylaw, you know, we'll work on that and the planning staff will be advised of that decision, uh, you know, as soon as we make it, which will be soon. It'll have to be. Any further questions, Mr. Henry? No, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, I think Mr. Meadows was up next. Uh, I, I agree with everything that Mr. Moore is saying. Uh, I think he needs to be given clarity, not only in this instance, but for all of the instances that may be coming up that are similar. There is another issue within this, and that is, um, can you or should we allow an instance where there's a special permit given for a building and then ha allow an additional building with an additional special permit on the same property, which seems to complicate this issue, but, it, but it's not an issue alone. It, it seems to me that it's it's a creep issue in some regards. I don't know what other you, word to use, in which um, we're adding special permits on special permits, which I I cannot imagine that was the intention of the bylaws. 
Hmm. And Mr. Moore should be given clarity on how to make a judgment on that. Thank you, Craig. <clears throat> Ms. Marshall, you have your hand up. Yes, but but I think I'll take it down because uh, I'll reserve it for our public meeting, the deliberation part. All right. Any other comments, questions from the board or from staff? All right. Um, we will have public comment and um, during the public hearing. Um, so um, Rob, what shall is it? You, for a phone, do you push four, uh, push pound and nine or push pound and four? Push pound and so nine? So I believe you press uh, star nine. Star nine. <laughs> on okay. the phone, yep. And for those who are in attendance can use the raise hand function. Right. So we'll now open public hearing on this matter. Um, if you wish to speak, please use the raise hand function on Zoom. Or if you're on your phone, press star nine to indicate you wish to speak. When you when called upon, please give your name and add for an address for the record. And please keep your comments to about three minutes. Most importantly, please remember that the issue before the board is whether to grant the applicants to request to withdraw the application without prejudice. We are not considering the merits of the application at this time. And if the board grants the request, the application is no longer before the board. If the board does not grant the request, then it may consider the request to continue consideration until October 26th. If that second request is approved and the substance of the application will be, and then the substance of the application will be considered by the board and public comment will be received at the October 26th hearing. So try to keep the public comment to the topic before us. I will help to remind speakers who wander into topics not before the board tonight. So if anybody wishes to comment, please raise your hand or push star nine on your phone. Rob and I will work to um, provide the ability for you to speak. So I did see a hand go up, but it immediately went down. Um, um, I guess we can give, oh, there's the hand. So we have Jasna right. Reg. And I'm going to give speaking permissions. Hello. Hello. Please give your name and address for the record. Hello. My name is Josna Reggae, and I live on 96 Farview Way. Um, I just have a very short comment um, with regard to this um, request to see the application withdrawn without prejudice. Along with the more than 45 other residents who signed our neighborhood letter asking you to reject this special permit application, I would be glad to see the application withdrawn. I would have thought, though, that the board had enough information before you by now to reject it altogether, rather than leaving all of us hanging in limbo for the next two years. While the uh, while laws are changed and to to allow this to go forward. So thank you for your service on the board. That's my only comment. Thank you. Are there other public comments? Not see any more public comments. Um, no, I don't either. Yeah. All right. So if there are no other public comments, um, we have an opportunity to, um, board can ask last uh, qu questions for the, of the applicant that can respond to the, the comments from the, the public. Um, are there any other board members comments before we move to a public meeting? All right, if not, if there are no further questions, we'll move to public meeting while keeping the public hearing open in case we need to gather additional information. The public meeting is where we board members deliberate and is generally not a uh, time for public comment. Do any board members have general thoughts on this request to withdraw before we deal with the motion itself? All right, um, 
Ms. Marshall, you are, you had already foreshadowed yeah. your comments right. in the public meeting, so you're up, up right. first so for I, sure. Okay, so I hope this is still not premature, but I, I, I want to respond to Ms. Greenbaum's um, comment that, if I heard it correctly, that she'd prefer it was withdrawn with prejudice. I think that is unfair at this time if if the how to interpret this 3.01 is really up in the air because if it comes back from the attorney or whoever if, if it is settled that it is a allowable use then we would have unfairly or i i think unfairly restricted the uh, potential applicant's ability to come back to us um it it might fail for other reasons it might be unsatisfactory proposal but um because the interpretation of this section of the bylaw is is evidently un quite uncertain um i don't i don't think we're in a position to deny it so it's my comment mr meadows i'm wondering what uh what the it seems as though the, the best thing if i'm correct is for the bylaw to be rewritten in a fashion which would give it clarity i'm wondering what the process is for rewriting a bylaw and what kind of time it takes to get that done no, nothing in amherst takes is quick yeah, and amending bylaws is is a, a complicated and I think it requires town council action and two thirds vote, but Mr. Mora, can you clarify that? Yes. Um, so bylaw amendments happen a, a few different ways, but typically, you know, they're either started by staff with, you know, a recommendation to the town manager to bring it to the council or uh, some other committee or board, such as the planning board, that would typically uh, do such a thing. Uh, it's a lengthy process, uh, a lot of it dictated by state law on how, how often and how hearings are held. And, you know, uh, in our experience, um, it's many, many months to get even the simplest um, bylaw amendment. Um, so I, I think although, it may go on the list. And to be honest, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of pieces of this bylaw that have unclear provisions such as this that leave, leave it up for interpretation, sometimes more challengeable than others. I think our goal in the short term is to get in the best legal position we can be with interpreting the bylaw so that our decision and the board's decision, the guidance provided to the board is best supported and you know we just need a little bit of time to do that and and then i can have a um you know what how i will interpret the bylaw when an applicant comes in to see me sort it out um you know i'm not prepared to do this tonight at the in this moment i you know i've already started thinking about this and just want to finish that and and be able to deal with that in the next application um, which is why the, you know, the unknown is really why the withdrawal makes, you know, good sense, good move. Um, the applicant was willing to do it. Um, if, if the withdrawal is denied and the board moves into making a decision about this particular subject, now we're, you know, we're open to litigation, not only from this applicant, but maybe another developer that's watching that was thinking of doing the same thing saying, oh, I can argue that other point. I can, I, can, I can make a case, which is what we heard from our town attorney. Yeah, I can support this, but I really wish it you know, said something different. So the bylaw amendments take time. It'll likely go on a list. I can see already we'd like to have this worded differently. I think it'll go on a list with the planning department, which is really long. And I, I, I wouldn't even wanna guess when I think that could come up uh, in, in future discussions. Uh, but I think in the short term, we have to make a decision. And often these public hearings could be multiple, especially if it comes from a different board that proposes the amendment initially. They sometimes could have two or three public hearings, and then 
town council might take a while with it too. So it's a very lengthy process. So this is a case, it seems to me that we're gonna to have to deal with some a gray area for a while. Right now it's undefined. And what we're looking for is using the best knowledge of town staff, resources from outside resources and state laws and other kinds of um, resources that Mr. Mora can use to form a view as to what complementary means and in, uh, in this case, for, in this instance uh, and apply that and then then it's going to be up to us for a while to to use that and because um, we're not going to get clearance from clear we're not going to get clarity from the town for quite a while um, and it could be a it could be a long time but we can get a better sense of what we should do with this uh, through an interpretation that, our, that uh, Mr. Moore and the town attorney and others can come up with, and that will help us. And, and it still means it's only one of the many factors we have to consider on an application. That's just one. And, and in this particular application, I believe there's other things as well that um, argue either for or against it, against it pretty strongly. So I, I think that withdrawal at this point in time, without prejudice, because I think Ms. Marshall is correct that there could be a way to get back, um, to come back before us if there's a different interpretation. And also, I don't know that it just seems punitive to me. I think the applicant got kind of caught up um, in, a, in something that they didn't understand. And I don't think I didn't fully understand the implications. And I think it seems punitive to me to not have to, to I, don't even know, I don't even know the way we can change the request from, from um, with, without prejudice to with prejudice, except by denying it, by going through the whole process and having the, and making decisions on the application. I don't know if we can, on our own, start the, uh, force the applicant to withdraw with prejudice. I'm just not sure we could do that. So I, this seems to me to be, make the most sense as a, as a, as a um, path. And I think it gives us the ability to make some decisions with greater information and greater clarity down the road. Um, so who was next? Um, Mr. Henry, were you up next? I, I was, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I do agree with you, Mr. Chair, with Ms. Marshall, that without prejudice is the most appropriate thing to do. Um, what, I, what I'm struggling with, though, is that um, <clears throat> the ZBA is a board of appeals. The, it, um, the, the bylaws is, doesn't have clarity that we're asking for. And to everyone's earlier point, we have pending applications that is similar. Um, the whole point is that the ZBA does their level best to make a, an appropriate interpretation. Um, yes, there's a possibility that we may get it wrong and somebody may challenge that. And But that's the whole point of the board. To delay this, to say, hey, let's get some further clarity from the random bylaws, I don't think that's realistic because, you know, if you think about when a law is written and it gets challenged and it goes to court, um, the court doesn't delay making decisions so the laws can be changed. And so that's the part that I'm struggling with here is that we're kicking the can, so to speak, so we can get somebody else to tell us what to do. <clears throat> now, I appreciate that, you know, the town attorneys may give us more guidance and that is appropriate, but to everyone's point, they cannot change the bylaws. And unless the bylaws are actually changed, this is the document that we have to live with, with everyone else that comes before us with a similar situation. So are we saying then by not making a decision here, when anyone else comes with something similar, we're gonna make the same ruling to say, we have to wait for the bylaws to be changed so we can actually make a decision. So while I think that the petitioner here is, I, withdrawing gives us, you know, some coverage, so to speak. Um, I I think we should have made a decision on this if we had if we had enough um information about what they're building and if everything's up to code and things like that, I think we should have made a decision rather than saying we need clarity on the bylaws. I think a decision should be made with what we have, understanding that this is the guidelines that we have now, and the ZBA's role is to make the level best decision with what we have. Because to, to everyone's point, re changing something takes time, and it's going to take a long time when there's so many committees and boards involved. So 
Um, the petitioner gave us a way out, but I think we need to work with what we have because this is going to come up again. And while we want Mr. Moore to have um, <clears throat> everything that he needs to make an informed decision, that's not what we are. We we have what we have, and we think, and I think we have to do a level plus to work within that. Mr. Henry, if I if I could just try to understand your your point, you're saying that we you, you your preference um, would have been to just to make a decision on this pending application and make a decision on complementary as well as the other uh, findings we have to make and, and move forward and have that be uh, what we have to operate on from the future. Yes. But one of the problems I had with this application is I don't know if the bylaw allowed us to even consider this application yet. And I need more clarity on that because one reading of that, app of that provision tells me there's no there's no role for the ZBA to approve a second dwelling uh, identical dwelling unit on that on a piece of uh, second duplex on that piece of property, and that we that really shouldn't have even been before us is one interpretation, and that I think that was a legitimate interpretation and needs more clarity and needs more uh, flush fleshing out and more investigation. The other ones there are other interpretations that came before us that the applicant had that there there was a complementary use. Um, so I think there was, I don't think that we had enough information right now to do what you want to do, which would be ideal and, and not have to have spending a, a, an evening discussing whether we should decide it something or not. It'd be great to have the, the information for us, but I thought there was too much, my reading was that there was too much ambiguity to even decide whether this could be legitimately before the ZBA. And then if it could be, I agree with you, then that's our job. Our job is to make calls on sometimes on some um, some issues that aren't clear or they or, or to make those findings with that's which are just judgments on our part um, we have to make those but I don't I wasn't sure that this should even be before us at this time and that's why I needed some further uh, that's why I like the idea of further clarification go ahead and Mr. I think I would have and I think I would have welcomed the conversation to say do we even have the authority to hear this petition and make a decision based on that? Well, yeah, that's, I mean, that's all part of the, I think that's all part of what the town staff and uh, attorney and other people need to help guide us on and give us more information. Then we can decide that. But I just, I don't know that we're ready to do that. I'm not ready to do that yet. And I'd like to have more information for the board. But I, I sympathize with your desire. I just don't have the, I just don't feel like I have the information I need. Mr. Moore, are you, do you want to respond to what I said? Not necessarily to what you said, but just that um, a reminder about the process here in Amherst, the rules and regulations of the Zoning Board of Appeals requires an applicant to come to me for authorization to, to move the application to the town clerk and ultimately to schedule a hearing with the board. General law, the zoning bylaw, authorizes the building commissioner to interpret the bylaw. So, you know, what, what will likely happen is that a decision will be made about this particular section and you will, uh, you may never see an application again like it, uh, it come in front of the board. Uh, because generally when I tell an applicant that they're, they're, the bylaw doesn't permit something from going forward, they move on to something else uh, and, it, and they look for another alternative. And if, and if they don't, they appeal that decision and then the board gets to hear both sides of the case and make a decision about my interpretation of the bylaw. So, you know, it's an intentional process to not put the board into this position that you're in. Of course, you interpret every section of the bylaw when you're reviewing, you know, when you're reviewing an application, whether it's a parking standard or a light fixture, and, and you'll continue to do that. But uh, this one, uh, I think, would be you know best if I could get to that place and not only advise this at this applicant here if they choose to come back and, and talk with us but others that are uh, you know thinking of doing something similar and and make sure that they're um, that the application is going forward and we're reviewing it 
in, in such a way that it's appropriate for the use that's being proposed. Uh, you know, if we're going to look at these applications differently, this language differently, it may result in a different review by staff. And, you know, that's a distribution to multiple departments, not just uh, the conservation development department. Mr. Henry, we've, we've gone down the road on your first question. Do you have other comments or do you want to continue on down this we path? We can continue with Ms. Greenbaum. I'm sorry. I I will um, ask my follow up later. Sure. I think Ms. Greenbaum has her hand up. All right, Ms. Greenbaum. I've been through this several times with the bylaw over my years. One case is a fraternity and a sorority. The same thing is that the same use, and that was with Bonnie Weeks, and it ended up that the frat won on appeal, but. My my number one suggestion is we really need to go through that bylaw and start over. And hopefully, I been we'd get somebody like Dodson and Flink over there who would come up with something like a they did for Northampton, which is a hybrid bylaw with form based code on top of an underlying code that looks at what's on the ground. And they did such a good job in Northampton. And I listened to some of those public comment hearings that they had. Um, I really wish we could go that route. Um, the second comment that I wanted to make is that I went back to 1927 and all the town reports that are online, looking at the, the annual report from the Zoning Board of Appeals. And I'll tell you back through the 40s and 50s, they, they denied more permits than they allowed, including for things like beauty shops and you would wonder why they would turn down a beauty shop but the information unfortunately isn't there i that was the first zoning by law in 27 28 so there was another huge revision in 1964 and i think from what i can tell and i'm i'm just sort of figuring this out i have no proof without the reports from the planning board, but I believe that this whole issue of complementary use came in the 1964 revision, because it seems to be in there since then. And if anybody could find a report from the planning board somewhere in archives, you might get some reason why they recommended that and what they had in mind when they recommended that complementary use be added to an existing zoning bylaw with that major revision. And that was just when the university started growing very fast. And then we had the, the SCOG report in the 70s, around 75, 76, when I joined the, the town meeting. But it might be good. What were they thinking of at the time? Because single use on a parcel seems so axiomatic that you can't find anything on online uh, in terms of court cases against it. And as I say, the two complementary uses that we find were a business development across from a residential development or in this two businesses in the same, and that were just those two cases in the last 50 years. So my, my last comment is going through the 80s with the rapid, everybody knew when they came in for, um, Amity Place, Salem Place, they knew, They all knew that they were going to get cut in half, so came in with a maximum number of units they could possibly get, and every single permit that came to I could have had 13 townhouses at 85 North Whitney Street, and I got eight. So, I mean, that's the way things were then. The people just didn't want the town changing so fast. So anyway, if somebody can find those notes in some archives from 1964, it might be a good idea to find out what people were thinking then. <laughs> it may be relevant. Who knows? Thank you, Mr. Greenbaum. Um, Mr. Henry, I know you had some more questions. I, I, I think um, <laughs> my, I, I, I don't think it's Actually, I, I can ask this. So if, if the intent here is to get more clarity on what does complementary mean, what, what are we looking for in terms of a timeline and a process for 
um, cases coming before the ZBA, future cases coming before the ZBA. Well, I guess there's two questions. One is how long does it take? I guess, right, you have two questions. One is how long is it gonna to take to come up with, with something uh, that we can consider? And secondly is what are the applications that are pending out there? Is that correct? Yes, and, and given and forgive me, given that we're talking about this particular petition, um, if there's a possibility to get clarity um, on the bylaw, would we say to um, the petitioner, we have more information, and we understand, and do we delay? vote in on their continuance until we to say let's get more information that way because to the public comment earlier there was a concern that the neighbor is going to be waiting for two years do we say let's not vote on the continuance today let's push this back to october 20 to october 26 see if we get the clarity that we need and then we can make a, a vote on the continuance or a vote to deny mm -hmm. If, if the bylaw says we can't grant what they're asking for. Okay. Um, well, I, I think there's a couple of questions there. Um, timing on clarity and timing of the other applications, I'll leave to, to Mr. Mora to, to speak to. And on your second question of whether it makes, and um, second question, second part of your question, I think you're saying, wouldn't it be better to just continue this and deal with it one way or the other, rather than put this off and then um, deny it now, let them withdraw it now, uh, rather than denying it, let them withdraw it now and come back with something else. Is that correct? Yes. So if, yes. So if, if we have some inclination to say, um, Mr. Moore has spoken to the attorneys or has a conference with the attorneys, and we may get some clarity on that section of the bylaw, um, would it make more sense rather than delaying a decision for this petitioner and the neighbors, quite frankly, um, to say, let's not vote tonight on the continuance, wait. Um, we're, we're, we're voting on withdrawal, right? I'm sorry, on, on the withdrawal. Okay. And say, okay, if we vote, then schedule a hearing, vote then, or if we have a response by the next date, then we can say, we now have a definitive answer to say, we cannot grant this. Therefore, it makes more sense to say no, rather than to just vote on your withdrawal. Uh, you know, I, I, we did have one person who felt that they would like to have um, a decision made tonight. And they, they're worried that they might have some period of, of uh, uncertainty. That could, that is, is a legitimate concern, but I think it also provides, in, in some ways, I think it provides more certainty to them if this is withdrawn. It's going to take some time for the applicant to re to reconsider this. They, they're part of the reason they're withdrawing. I think is not just the complementary use, but the other issues that were raised in the application, and I think this gives them time to reconsider and re. Um, refocus or, or perhaps redo the, the application so it'll be different than we see it today. And, um, and, I, and I think that we are sending a message that we hear that in, from the neighbors already. And it's one of the things that I, one of the reasons I think this, one of the reasons I think that voting to a, allow the withdrawal without prejudice makes sense is that I think a signal that the board hears concerns not only about complimentary and whether we can even hear this application, but about other, other aspects of the application. So I'm, and I would rather, rather not uh, bind up our schedule with uncertainty about whether we're gonna have an, a new application or just consider the same thing again. I'd like to give them time to come back, rethink it and come, come forward, maybe talk with the neighbors, maybe do some consultation, things that could make it easier to come to, come to a decision on an on a application that might work. So all in all, I would rather dispose of this now, tell them to come back and do it. Um, and then, then we can come back with something else if they indeed want to do that, and then we can move forward. That would be my preference. But 
but I caused a lot of hands to be raised on that response. <laughs> and so I want to give uh, people a chance to, to comment. Um, one, Mr. Mora, and then Mr. Wachilla, please. Yeah, I just wanted to mention to, to Mr. Henry that, you know, it's, it's not just the complementary finding that I'm sure, or complementary, what is complementary that, that I'm struggling with. It's whether or not this type of application even gets that consideration, because it might just be no, that it's prohibited and stop there in the read of the language and and not even consider whether or not the two uses are complementary. That's the first decision that I have to make. And then from that point forward, then there might be a, um, a case in front of the board, in front of the planning, in front of the zoning board, the planning board, myself, where you have to make a decision if the two uses are complementary or agree to that. You know, so I think this board will will have that question in front of them someday, and let them, you know, until this language changes, and that will be the time to really dig into what does complementary mean and how is it applied in in, in that particular case. Um, there are no applications that have been submitted. Uh, so the timing, I would say there isn't one that's going to be in front of the board. Um, if, um, if the decision after I look at this is that um, if the two principal uses are not different classification types, if the decision in that situation is that the complementary finding isn't applicable, they won't be coming to the board. They're gonna they're gonna be told that it's not permitted by this bylaw, you know, unless somewhere in the bylaw authorizes it. Um, so you know that's that's the decision that would be made. Um, that's the decision I'm gonna have to make for applications and and for uh, applicants that are working on applications right now. Uh, so this this discussion has forced that to happen. Whether or not you deny the application, I still have to do that, you know. And it, and you would hope that you, that the decisions would align, uh, but they don't have to. Uh, I still have to go through that process and and make an interpretation of the bylaw and advise an applicant based on their their proposal. Uh, so that I wouldn't expect anytime soon for the board to be seeing an application, uh, you know, unless it's really clear to me that. It's authorized by uh, by the provisions of the bylaw. Ms. Marshall, I think it makes sense to allow the applicant to withdraw this. They don't want to go forward. I, I gather for any number of reasons, not solely, although it's a threshold question of whether it's um, permitted. Um, but I wonder when Mr. Mora gets his um, comes comes to an interpretation that he's comfortable with after consulting with with whoever he needs to talk to, can he come back and tell us, tell the public what that interpretation is? Because otherwise, let's say no further projects come to us, we don't know if it's because they've been told no because the interpretation is it's not allowed, or the interpretation is it is allowed, but no one's proposed that yet. So I guess I'd, I'd like to know what the upshot of the um, reconsideration of this 3.01 is. Mr. Morrow? Absolutely. I mean, everybody here now has spent a, a tremendous amount of time thinking about this for this application and talking about this tonight will make certain to put on a agenda item. Uh, you know, ideally you wanna get this, make sure this group is all aware of it. Um, if, if not, I'll do something in writing or, uh, you know, maybe we have a business meeting coming up soon that we can talk about it, but uh, absolutely uh, everyone will, will know what's happening with this matter going forward. Including the public. I mean, because this would need to be yeah. widely understood or at least in, available available to potential applicants right? right and i just just to remind you interpretations of the bylaw happen every single day 
you know, so I, I know this one's getting a lot of discussion and, and is confusing um, at times, but it happens every single day. So, you know, we'll continue to, to do our best to, to make those available and, and, and be consistent. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Wachilla, you had your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just kind of building off what Rob said earlier about um, the applicant withdrawing their, um, sorry, the applicant withdrawing their, their petition. It gives them the ability to rethink the whole project and kind of shape it in a way that fits in better with the bylaw. So say if they didn't want to pursue the current petition as is, they could definitely reshape it to make it more acceptable to the zoning bylaw. And there, there are a number of issues that still have to be addressed too, just from the last hearing alone. Like the biggest one from what I've seen in my zoning review is the lot coverage calculations. I mean, those have to be better explained and we need more detail on that. I mean, that's that's one factor that could prevent this whole thing from happening if it was presented as is. And other things that might take even longer than a month to, to address on the applicant's end. So granting the withdrawal would give the applicant the ability to make a better proposal down the road because they'll take all of these comments into consideration. You also have the issue with the second curb cut going on Old Town Road. You have the bus stop that's supposed to go right there in front of the house and blocking their act their existing curb cut that goes on North Pleasant Street. So there's a lot of things that have to be rehashed on the applicant's end. And then if they were to come back to us with a with a new permit, you would think that it would be incorporating all of those comments and feedbacks that were given to them. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Wachilla. All right. Are there other comments from members of the board or staff regarding the um, motion to withdraw or the request to, from the petitioner to withdraw without prejudice? All right. If there are no further comments or questions, um, I would entertain a motion that we approve the request of the petitioner to withdraw this application without prejudice. So moved. Is there a second? Aye. It's moved and seconded. <laughs> so now we have discussion on that motion. Um, I think this is the right thing to do. I, I don't know how we would get to um, approving, I don't know how we get to um, making this with prejudice, because I, I don't think we can do that on our own. Um, the only way we can effectively do that is, is to go through the whole process and deny it. But I think we, if by doing this, we are sending a, a clear message to the applicant that there are, that not only are there threshold questions of whether this can even be considered, but there are other questions that force us to really examine this application very closely. And those are questions that were mostly raised from the neighbors, also just, I think, public health and safety questions, as well as management, as well as those questions that uh, Rob Wachilla just raised about curb cuts and transportation and a host of other things that I think really are, are troublesome. And so I think this gives, this shows, I think this demonstrates the applicant knows he's got, they have a problem with this, this uh, project. And I would encourage them to spend the time if they want to do something in addition, uh, do additional work on this property, that they spend time talking with the neighbors not only about how it's currently managed, but about what they could do in the future. And I think that would make a ton of, would bode well for uh, this applicant and for the neighborhood. And so on, for, on those grounds, I think this makes sense. Um, but I'd like to hear from other people before we go to a vote. Ms. Greenbaum, you have your hand up. Yeah, you know, I just want to say I very much agree with you. Um, I will reluctantly vote I, but I think that knocking heads together has worked very well in a couple of other projects, beginning with the one on Pine Street and Sunset Fearing. And I think they ended up with a much better project and happier neighbors, at least on Pine Street. I haven't heard any complaints lately. And and the project on in you know on Sunset Fearing is turning out to be a very attractive example for what can be done. And so I will 
reload and and put in another plug please to spend some of that planning grant money that you've gotten to redo the bylaw <laughs> it's now more than 50 years old that needs to be updated and we didn't like the form-based code that came in from North Amherst. It was too much like North Alston. I said they took a shoebox off the <laughs> shelf and gave us North Alston. But we really need something that, that looks like Amherst and can t and meanwhile provide places for more housing for people, middle-income housing families to send their kids to the schools so we can <laughs> schools. Anyway, that's the end of my rant. Thank you, Ms. Greenbaum. Any other comments? Questions on the motion? If there are no further comments, um, the vote occurs on the motion to approve the request of the, for the applicant to approve the request to withdraw the application ZBA FY 2023 12 798 800 North Pleasant Street without prejudice. This requires a roll call vote and requires three votes out of five. A um, simple majority. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. Henry. Aye. Ms. Marshall. Aye. Ms. Greenbaum. Aye. <clears throat> the vote is 5 0. The motion is approved. Um, the application is withdrawn without prejudice. I think by, by that fact, the other um, request you had into us is moot and is. Um, off the table, so your application is is out there, and I do want to um, encourage the applicant, the owners of that property, if they indeed do want to pursue additional uh, work on that site, to work with the neighbors to try to get uh, a better project and to be comp uh, aware of what we decide on uh, and the guidance we're given on the threshold issue of complementary, and whether you can even have two, <laughs> even have two duplexes on the same piece of property. There's some pretty big issues there. All right, thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we have no other applications or business before us except a uh, general comment period. Uh, this is where the public can speak uh, on any matter not before the board tonight. So if anybody in the public wishes to speak on this, on any issue, other than the issue that we dealt with tonight, um, this is the time to do that. And Rob, I don't see any hands up. And we have four people as attendees, but no hands up. Okay. Uh, no hands up, Mr. Chairman. All right. Then lastly, we have uh, any new business, any business that has not been uh, anticipated in the last 48 hours. I, you know, Rob, I'd like you to discuss scheduling for the future and uh, outreach to members to serve on, on the several panels we have coming up, if you could. Well, luckily the panels are a little bit light in the coming months with the exception of the 4EB project. So um, as of right now on October 12th, which is our next meeting, uh, yeah. we have the continued public hearing for the Shrewsbury Road solar project, uh, which a few of you are panelists on. And we also have a new petition for a change of use from a owner occupied duplex to a non owner occupied duplex on 62 Taylor street. On October 19th, we have our first hearing for Valley CDC's 40B project, um, 20 to 40 Ball Lane. It's the address. It is a nine acre site. They're going to construct 15 affordable duplexes, um, essentially creating 30 affordable owner occupied. So they wouldn't be rentals, they'll be owner projects. Um, sorry, owner um, units. And they uh, are pretty much all set to go on the 19th. The only thing that we have to discuss, Mr. Chairman, is setting up a schedule for that. So the way the 4EBs work is that they require usually around five to six hearings. And after discussing with, with Steve Judge Chairman, um, he decided to do those hearings on off Thursdays as opposed to the normally scheduled, sorry, second and fourth Thursday of every month. So basically... What Steve wanted to talk about, and I'm, I don't know if this is still true, is I guess who here tonight would be interested in serving on such a panel. And I guess just making you guys aware that this schedule will be developed 
and eventually shared with all the members. So those of you who are interested in serving on this 40B panel can can indicate as such. And I don't know if I'm missing anything, Steve. Was there anything else you want to touch upon besides? Yeah, that's really what I wanted to do is just, yeah. just, just identify the things we have coming yeah. up and and let people know that we're going to, because we have some, I think, really hearing intensive proposals before us, that we're going to start doing this every week for a while because we just won't get it done otherwise. And so what at I would like until, to sorry, at least until like the 40B is over. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah until the 40B is over. And, and, and it may not be very controversial, but I'd like to get started on affordable. I'd like to make affordable housing a priority and I'd like to move quickly on it because I think that's really important, especially with the home ownership uh, twist to it. I think it's really important to do. So what I'd like you to do, uh, members of the board, please let Rob know if you will be available to serve on the um, alternative alternate week panels for the 40B or if you if you can have the time for it, if, if your schedule does not permit it, you've already just baked in the normal time that you on Thursday nights. But if you're available, please let me know. My inclination is always I go with the permanent mem the full members. That's the first shot. They're up full members. We'll try to get them everyone on board. But I think uh, I think John Gilbert cannot serve or may not be able to serve on the 40B panel. So there is if there's a there might be a, a place for a, a, an alternate to help um, on, to serve on this panel. Mr. Wachilla. So the only yeah. person who's indicated that they would 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 be willing to serve is actually Hilda. Hilda emailed me Good. earlier saying that she'd be willing to serve on such a panel. Um, Sarah Marshall said that she would be unable to. All right. Well, well, my hesitation is only that I'm on the ballot in November and I don't know until that yeah. happens <laughs> what the demands on my time might be. Exactly. So we see these hearings going probably until like the end of the year, if they're going to be on the first and third Thursday. Um, so I guess, you know, board members who are here and I can reach out to everybody tomorrow because that's when we we'll start creating the schedule. You know, right. just let me know if if you have the time on those off Thursdays to contribute to this. If you don't, that's totally fine. It's just I'm going to create the schedule just so everybody has it so they know what dates to section off for this 40B hearing. Um, yeah. And see if you can. I was going to ask. Can, yep. I was going to ask. Can you can you send the schedule so I can look and yep. let you know? Yeah, I could do that tomorrow, and um, just so everybody has it. Mr. Mora. I just wanted to mention that you know these forty B projects are really interesting uh, and something different than what the board normally does. Uh, and there's another one coming, so right behind it. So anyone who misses the opportunity. Uh, you know, there's a 70 unit project uh, on the town owned properties on Belcher Town Road in the East Street School uh, being proposed by Wayfinders that, you know, looks like it's about a couple of months behind the Valley CDC project. So there'll be there'll be more uh, opportunities to review comp permits. And when he means right after he means in sometime in the spring is when they would most likely come before the board because Valley submitted their PEL, which is their general public comment period back in this past spring and now they're coming before us in um, October so generally there's like a, a big kind of time gap in this uh, 40b process before they can actually get to the hearing but what it really means is that you have great opportunities to sit in more hearings and and this time <laughs> I think you'll be doing some really good work because I think both of these as represented so far show great promise and um it's actually, I think it's, they're, they really show great promise to, to provide housing in, in the town that we desperately need. Um, Hilda? No, I'm I just... I'm just going to bomb. I don't need to just... <laughs> you can call me whatever you want. <laughs> oh. um, no, I just wanted to say that the reason I applied to be an associate member of the of the zoning board is because I knew all these hearings were coming up and I've been there, done that many times. And so I thought you needed help. Like, that's all I wanted to say. Well, thank you. We do. All right, Rob, you'll send out send out tomorrow uh, the hearing schedule, let people respond. Um, then you and I will talk about how we set up panels going forward for the these uh, this and the solar. Our solar is already set up, but for this, for the, uh, the alternate weeks, okay? Sounds, Sounds good. Do people have any other new business, any questions, anything else you wish to discuss? Um, at this time, administrative matters or 
or anything. Okay. Well, and if nothing else, we can move to adjournment, and it's only 7.30. So you have, you have some time um, for yourself tonight on a Thursday night. Um, <laughs> do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right. It's moved and seconded that we adjourn. This is not debatable, but does require a roll call vote. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. Henry. Aye. Ms. Marshall. Aye. Ms. Greenbaum. Aye. Motion is carries. The vote is unanimous. We are adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks for your work tonight and, and for uh, all the consideration you gave to the issues we had to discuss.